Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Israel is continuing to attack Gaza as Palestinians mark the first day of Ramadan. The death toll from Israel's five-month assault has topped 31,000. Health officials in Gaza say at least 27 Palestinians have starved to death due to Israel's ongoing blockade of aid deliveries. Over the weekend, five Palestinians died in northern Gaza as a pallet of food aid crushed them to death after a parachute failed to open. The United States has begun shipping parts to build a temporary port off the coast of Gaza to increase aid, following President Biden's announcement during his State of the Union address last week. But many groups say the plan will take too long and is insufficient to address the looming famine in Gaza. The head of Doctors Without Borders in the U.S. said, quote, the U.S. plan for a temporary pier in Gaza to increase the flow of humanitarian aid is a glaring distraction from the real problem, Israelis' indiscriminate and disproportionate military campaign and punishing siege, unquote. Inside Gaza, Palestinians are struggling to find any food to eat. I came here to buy, but I can't find anything to buy. There's nothing. There are no dates or milk or anything. One can't find anything for their children. How are we supposed to have sahur, the meal before the fast starts at dawn? How are we supposed to have iftar, the meal that breaks the fast? With canned goods? All these canned goods are full of germs that infect the stomach. We need vegetables and fruits to feed our children because they've weakened and died from hunger. During an interview on MSNBC, President Biden criticized Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu by saying he's hurting Israel more than helping Israel. He has a right to defend Israel, a right to continue to pursue Hamas, but he must, he must, he must pay more attention to the innocent lives being lost as a consequence of the actions taken. He's hurting, in my view, he's hurting Israel more than helping Israel by making the rest of the world. It's contrary to what Israel stands for. And I think it's a big mistake. So I want to see a ceasefire. In the same interview with MSNBC's Jonathan Capehart, Biden warned Netanyahu against invading Raha. But he also vowed to keep arming Israel regardless of what Israel does in Gaza. What is your red line with Prime Minister Netanyahu? Do you have a, a, a red line? For instance, would invasion of Rafah, which you have urged him not to do, would that be a red line? It is a red line, but I'm never going to leave Israel. The defense of Israel is still critical, so there's no red line. I'm going to cut off all weapons so they don't have the Iron Dome to protect them. They don't have. But there's red lines that if he crosses and they cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead. Netanyahu responded by vowing to defy Biden's red line on Rafa, saying, quote, we'll go there. We're not going to leave. Caribbean leaders are holding an emergency meeting in Jamaica today to discuss the political and humanitarian crisis in Haiti, where armed groups are attempting to force the resignation of Haiti's unelected prime minister, Ariel Henry, who's long been a U.S. ally. Henri has been stranded in Puerto Rico since last week, unable to return home as increasing violence has left Haitians struggling to secure food and water. Over the weekend, the U.S. flew a team of Marines into Haiti as the security situation around the U.S. embassy deteriorated. Non-essential staff at the embassy were airlifted out of Haiti. We'll have more on Haiti after headlines. Pope Francis has called on Ukraine to have the courage to wave the white flag and begin negotiations with Russia. The Pope made the comment in an interview with the Swiss broadcaster RSI. It is one interpretation. It's true. But I think that the strongest one is the one who looks at the situation, thinks about the people, and has the courage of the white flag, of negotiating. And today, you can negotiate with the help of the international powers. There are some. The word negotiate is a courageous word. When you see that you are defeated, when things are not going well, you have to have the courage to negotiate. One may feel shame, but how many dead will the war end up with? And it will end even worse. One should negotiate in time. Find a country that can be a mediator. Several Ukrainian and European officials criticized the Pope's call for negotiations. In New York, 
former Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez was found guilty of cocaine trafficking after a two-week trial. Federal prosecutors had accused Hernandez of ruling the Central American country as a narco state, accepting millions of dollars in bribes from drug traffickers in exchange for protection. Celebrations erupted following Friday's verdict. This is a Honduran activist speaking outside Manhattan's federal courthouse. The rotten political class we have has brought the country to total collapse. And everyone we see here, this entire community thirsting for justice, is a clear example of a society in total collapse that has been trampled on and sunk by corrupt politicians. Hernandez was arrested in February of 2022, less than a month after his presidential term ended, and extradited to the U.S. in April 2022. He was a longtime U.S. ally. His brother is already serving a life sentence in the U.S. for smuggling cocaine. Juan Orlando Hernandez faces life in prison as well. We'll have more on the trial later in the show. The Sudanese military has rejected U.N. calls for a truce in fighting with its rival rapid support forces during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. The RSF had said it welcomed the truce. The U.N. Security Council adopted a resolution Friday urging an end to nearly one year of fighting. The U.N. also expressed grave concern over the deteriorating humanitarian crisis in Sudan. This is China's deputy U.N. ambassador speaking Friday. The lives of all the people in the world are precious. While adopting a resolution on a ceasefire during the month of Ramadan in Sudan, the Security Council must not forget that the people of Gaza are still suffering under bombardment. The international community must push forward for an immediate ceasefire and an end to the conflict in Gaza to give the people some hope for survival and provide the basic security necessary for all religious activities by the Muslims there. In an interview with MSNBC, President Biden said he regrets using the word illegal during his State of the Union to address a Venezuelan, to describe a Venezuelan immigrant accused of killing Lake and Riley, a Georgia nursing student. An undocumented person. And I shouldn't have used illegal. I should have, it's undocumented. So you, you regret using that word? Yes. During a campaign rally in Georgia, former President Donald Trump attacked Biden over the issue. When I say he was an illegal alien, he was an illegal immigrant, he was an illegal migrant, and he shouldn't have been in our country, and he never would have been under the Trump policy. During the same speech, Trump mocked President Biden's stutter. Wasn't it, didn't it bring us together? Remember, he said, I'm going to bring the country to, 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 together. I'm going to bring it together. No, no. Donald Trump's rally in Georgia came a day after he hosted Hungary's authoritarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban at Mar-a-Lago. Trump openly praised Orban's autocratic style of rule. There's nobody that's better, smarter, or a better leader than Viktor Orban. He's fantastic. He's the, as you know, the Prime Minister of Hungary, and does a great job. A non controversial figure because he said this is the way it's going to be, and that's the end of it. But right? he's the boss. That was Donald Trump speaking at Mar a Lago. A UN fact finding mission has found Iran is responsible for the physical violence that killed Masa Amini in September 2022, sparking historic nationwide protests for months. Masa Amini was a 22 year old Kurdish woman who was arrested by Iran's so called morality police allegedly for not wearing a hijab properly. Hundreds of people were arrested in demonstrations that erupted after her death. In a recent report, U.N. officials also accused Tehran of committing crimes against humanity while employing, quote, unnecessary and disproportionate use of lethal force, unquote, to crack down on the protests. Hundreds were killed by Iranian police forces, while at least nine demonstrators have been executed. Millions of people across the globe took to the streets Friday, marking International Women's Day. Marches took place in Pakistan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Spain, Ukraine, Brazil, and dozens of cities around the world. In a historic move, France enshrined abortion rights in its constitution as crowds gathered in Paris Friday. Meanwhile, over 180,000 people rallied in Mexico City, denouncing rampant gender violence and femicides as nearly 10 women were killed every day in Mexico last year. Me 
I worry about my friends. I am worried something might happen to my daughter when she goes out to the street. I am worried for all the women who never returned home and the families who are looking for them. And hundreds of protesters calling for a ceasefire in Gaza blocked traffic on Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood Sunday, forcing a short delay to the start of the Oscars. Several actors and musicians wore red artists for ceasefire pins, including Oscar-winning Billie Eilish, Rami Youssef and Mark Ruffalo, who arrived late to the ceremony due to the protests. During the Oscar ceremony, filmmaker Jonathan Glazer condemned the Israeli occupation after his Holocaust film, The Zone of Interest, won an Oscar for Best International Film. Our film shows where dehumanization leads at its worst. It shaped all of our past and present. Right now, we stand here as men who refute their Jewishness and the Holocaust being hijacked by an occupation which has led to conflict for so many innocent people. Whether the victims of October the... Whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza, all the victims of this dehumanization, how do we resist? The Oscar for Best Documentary went to 20 Days in Mariupol about Russia's siege on the Ukrainian city. The film was directed by Mrs. Slav Chernoff, a Ukrainian video journalist with the Associated Press. This is the first. This is the first Oscar in the Ukrainian history. And I'm honored. I'm honored. But probably I will be the first director on this stage who will say, I wish I would never made this film. I wish to be able to exchange this to Russia never attacking Ukraine, never occupying our cities. Go to Democracy Now! to see our coverage of 20 Days in Mariupol and the Zone of Interest. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman.